I think I have said that it is the custom in our club to discuss gardening during the spring and summer, or rather to hear the tales of what various members have been doing in their gardens, or of any wonderful growth that has come unwantedly early or incredibly large in the garden of any one of us. But when the season of fogs returns, and the sun sets behind houses before the middle of luncheon, it is rather our custom to tell tales of brighter scenes, to keep our little crescent before the fire from falling asleep, or from drifting away one by one to toy with some tedious business. It was upon such an occasion as this that one of our group in his chair before the fire, who seemed about to be falling asleep, suddenly opened his eyes wide and exclaimed, For the Lord's sake, someone tell us of somewhere where there is sunlight. And I heard Jorkins draw in a breath. But before he had time to speak, the voice of Turbot was raised. And let's hear of England this time, he said. I'm tired of the ends of the earth. A more deliberate attempt to put Jorkins out of his stride I have seldom heard, but it had no effect. I saw a curious thing once in England, Jorkins said, a very curious thing. I was taking a walk out of London once, a long walk with sandwiches and a good flask, one that would hold a pint. Partly I went for exercise, but it was more to please the spirit than the body that I went. I had somehow got tired of pavements. You know how one feels then, and spring was coming in with a rush. <laughs> I don't know what way I went, only that it must have been roughly southwards, for the sun was in my eyes until it got round to my right. I started early and had no lunch until some time after two, for I would not sit down and eat till I was completely clear of London. I must have done a good twenty miles. I sat myself down on a bank of grass by the road with a hedge in front of me as green as a meteor along the top of a bank on the opposite side. Primroses were out on the bank and early violets. There I ate my lunch with birds singing and white clouds scurrying over the dome of a blue sky. What was the other side of the hedge on the bank I had no idea. I could see neither through nor over. I sat there wondering comfortably all through my lunch. And after lunch, my long walk, the bright sun, birds singing, and one thing and another, were bringing a drowsiness on me, when a sudden bout of curiosity made me leap up and cross the road and look for a gap in the hedge. Through a gap low down among the stems of the thorn, I saw smooth lawns stretching away, and a little house with bow windows and bottle glass panes and red roof that was clearly the house of a golf club and looking at it through the hedge never soothed my curiosity, for the light of spring was hanging so strongly over those lawns that they somehow seemed to have the glow of lawns seen long ago in the early morning, and remembered almost from infancy. There seemed something as magical about them as that. I was a lot slenderer in those days, and once I got my head through the gap in the hedge, it was only a matter of wriggling. No one was playing golf, and I walked up to the clubhouse with not a soul in sight, no sound of anyone stirring. Grass of Parnassus was flowering in such abundance that I wondered if those smooth lawns were not too marshy for golf. I came all in the silence to the oaken door of the golf club, and there a hall porter, glittering with livery that was out of date in its splendor, opened the door at once. I had then to apologize and explain I was lost. And thinking to put a better face on it to an official of the club than to the hall porter, or at any rate hoping to gain time, I asked to see the secretary. Well, the secretary was in the little clubhouse, and the hall porter brought him at once. What can I do for you, he said, all amiability. I wanted to apologize. I said, I'm not a member of your golf club. I lost my way on your links. He smiled away my apology. It's not a golf club, he said. Well, I thought it was a golf club, said I. No, he replied, it's a club, as a matter of fact, for poets. For poets, I said. Yes, said the secretary, and what may quite surprise you, for the poets of all time. Of all time, I said. Yes, he repeated, and beckoning me forward to the inner doors of the hall, he pointed through its glass panes. There you see Swinburne, he said, talking to Herrick. And sure enough, I recognized the earnest face of Swinburne talking, and saw the man that the secretary told me was Herrick giving little answering chuckles. 
And somehow, in spite of what the secretary had said, it didn't surprise me at all. There was something so fairy-like in the light on the lawns before I got to the club, and something so far from this age in the little house that it seemed only natural that it had gathered up from the ages what was lost to other lawns. I should not have been surprised to see Homer himself. And sure enough, there he stood, stroking his beard, eyes full of thought, giving me somehow the impression of a tremendous Tory. <laughs> and there's Stephen Phillips, he said, talking to Dante. And I recognized the two men and seemed to see through the rather dim glass of the door a certain resemblance of feature. A bit lucky, wasn't he, getting elected, I said, pointing to Stephen Phillips. Well, yes, said the secretary, but you have luck in all clubs. There's always somebody who may be just not quite. And then Tennyson went by on the other side of the shimmering glass. I recognized him immediately. He's having a bit of a slump over there, I said, pointing over the lawns to the way by which I had come. Oh, he's all right here, said the secretary. And the waiters, I said, for they were passing to and fro. All writers, too, he said, all wrote good stuff, but not immortal. He's the best we have on our staff, he said, pointing to the hall porter. That's Pope. Pope, I said, is it really? I suppose your standard of membership, very high, he said. You see, we have Shakespeare, Milton, all of them. There goes Shelley. And sure enough, I saw a light figure slipping by to drop what looked like a political pamphlet unnoticed in somebody's hat. And the name of the club, I asked. The Elysian Club, he said. Somehow I thought so. Pope, only a hall porter. Homer himself a member. Who then was the secretary? That was the question which in this extraordinary club, where I might have found so much of overpowering interest, became the one thought that absorbed me. What a power is curiosity when once awakened. I might have heard Shakespeare speak, and yet I wasted my time in trying to satisfy my miserable curiosity as to who the secretary was. Of course, you write yourself, I said. Very little, he answered. I gave it up long ago. Gave it up? That was even more baffling than ever, yet greater than Pope, whoever he was. Was he Keats? I thought for a moment, for Keats perhaps wrote little compared to some of them, but no, Keats never gave it up. There was nothing for it but to ask him his name, which I did, and he told me. And do you know, it conveyed to me nothing whatever. And that was awkward. It left me saying, yes, yes, of course, in remarks like that, too transparent not to be seen through. But he took no offense. No, 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 you wouldn't have heard of me, he said. I never wrote enough. One great line, that's what the members say. If I had written 30, I could have been a member myself, but only one great line, they say. Better than that fellow, you know, he said, pointing to the hall porter. Yet not enough for full membership, but I am an honorary member. Well, I've read a good deal of poetry knocking about the world, and the line might convey something where the name never could. And sure enough, it did. I asked him if he would mind repeating the line to me, and he began at once. A rose red, he began, but I got the rest of it in before he had time to. City half as old as time, said I. Yes, he said, a rose-red city half as old as time, repeating the beautiful line, like a good host relishing a taste of his century-old port. It's a pity I couldn't have made thirty of them, but I am really very comfortable as I am. Would you like to see my office? Well, he showed me into a very snug little room, and I should have liked to stop and talk with him, and especially to see more of the members, but after all, I had forced my way into the club and had taken up quite enough of his time already, so I offered him my pint flask, which, of course, I had filled with whiskey, as some slight return for his trouble. And do you know, he drank up every drop of it. When I opened it for a drop for myself, when I got back to the road, I found it was quite empty. The Gibbelins eat, as is well known, nothing less good than man. Their evil tower is joined to terra cognita, to the lands we know, by a bridge. Their hoard is beyond reason. Avarice has no use for it. They have a separate cellar for emeralds and a separate cellar for sapphires. They have filled a hole with gold and dig it up when they need it. 
and the only use that is known for their ridiculous wealth is to attract to their larder a continual supply of food. In times of famine, they have even been known to scatter rubies abroad, a little trail of them to some city of man, and sure enough, their larders would soon be full again. Their tower stands on the other side of that river known to Homer, Ocean, as he called it, which surrounds the world. And where the river is narrow and fordable, the tower was built by the Giblin's sires, for they like to see burglars rowing easily to their steps. Some nourishment the huge trees drained there with their colossal roots from both banks of the river. There the Giblins lived and discreditably fed. Alderic, knight of the order of the city and the assault, hereditary guardian of the king's peace of mind, a man not unremembered among the makers of myth, pondered so long upon the Giblins' hoard that by now he deemed it his. Alas that I should say of so perilous adventure undertaken at dead of night by a valorous man, that its motive was sheer avarice. Yet upon avarice only the Giblins relied to keep their larders full, and once in every hundred years sent spies into the cities of men to see how avarice did, and always the spies returned again to the tower, saying that all was well. It may be thought that as the years went on and men came by fearful ends on that tower's wall, fewer and fewer would come to the Giblins' table, but the Giblins found otherwise. Not in the folly and frivolity of his youth did Alderic come to the tower, but he studied carefully for several years the manner in which burglars met their doom when they went in search of the treasure that he considered his. In every case, they had entered by the door. He consulted those who gave advice on this quest. He noted every detail and cheerfully paid their fees and determined to do nothing that they advised. For what were their clients now? <laughs> no more than examples of the savory art, mere half-forgotten memories of a meal, and many, perhaps, no longer even that. These were the requisites for the quest that these men used to advise. A horse, a boat, male armor, and at least three men at arms. Some said, blow the horn at the tower door. Others said, do not touch it. Alderic thus decided he would take no horse down to the river's edge. He would not row along it in a boat, and he would go alone and by way of the forest unpassable. How passed, you may say, by the unpassable? This was his plan. There was a dragon he knew of who, if peasants' prayers are heeded, deserved to die, not alone because of the number of maidens he cruelly slew, but because he was bad for the crops. He ravaged the very land and was the bane of a dukedom. Now Alderic determined to go up against him. So he took horse and spear and pricked till he met the dragon. And the dragon came out against him, breathing bitter smoke. And to him Alderic shouted, Hath foul dragon ever slain true knight? And well the dragon knew that this had never been, and he hung his head and was silent, for he was glutted with blood. Then said the knight, If thou wouldst ever taste maiden's blood again, thou shalt be my trusty steed, and if not, by this spear there shall befall thee all that the troubadours tell of the dooms of thy breed. And the dragon did not open his ravening mouth, nor rush upon the knight breathing out fire, for well he knew the fate of those that did these things. But he consented to the terms imposed, and swore to the knight to become his trusty steed. It was on a saddle upon this dragon's back that Alderic afterwards sailed above the unpassable forest, even above the tops of those measureless trees, children of wonder. But first he pondered that subtle plan of his, which was more profound than merely to avoid all that had been done before, and he commanded a blacksmith, and the blacksmith made him a pickaxe. 
Now, there was a great rejoicing at the rumor of Alderic's quest, for all folk knew that he was a cautious man, and they deemed that he would succeed and enrich the world, and they rubbed their hands in the cities at the thought of largesse, and there was joy among all men in Alderic's country, except perchance among the lenders of money, who feared that they would soon be paid. And there was rejoicing also because men hoped that when the Giblins were robbed of their hoard, they would shatter their high-built bridge and break the golden chains that bound them to the world and drift back, they and their tower, to the moon from which they had come and to which they rightly belonged. There was little love for the Giblins, though all men envied their hoard. So they all cheered that day when he mounted his dragon as though he was already a conqueror. And what pleased them more than the good that they had hoped he would do to the world was that he scattered gold as he rode away. For he would not need it, he said, if he found the Giblin's hoard, and he would not need it more if he smoked on the Giblin's table. When they heard that he had rejected the advice of those that gave it, some said that the knight was mad, and others said he was greater than those that gave the advice, but none appreciated the worth of his plan. He reasoned thus. For centuries men had been well advised and had gone by the cleverest way, while the Giblins came to expect them to come by boat and to look for them at the door whenever their larder was empty, even as a man looketh for a snipe in the marsh. But how, said Aldrich, if a snipe should sit in the top of a tree, and would men find him there? Assuredly never. So Aldrich decided to swim the river, and not to go by the door, but to pick his way into the tower through the stone. Moreover, it was in his mind to work below the level of the ocean, the river, as Homer knew, that girdles the world, so that as soon as he made a hole in the wall, the water should pour in, confounding the giblins and flooding the cellars, rumored to be twenty feet in depth, and therein he would dive for emeralds as a diver dives for pearls. And on the day that I tell of, he galloped away from his home, scattering largesse of gold, as I have said, and passed through many kingdoms, the dragons snapping at maidens as he went, but being unable to eat them because of the bit in his mouth, and earning no gentler reward than a spurthurst where he was softest. And so they came to the swart, arboreal precipice of the unpassable forest. The dragon rose at it with a rattle of wings, Many a farmer near the edge of the world saw him up there, where yet the twilight lingered, a faint black wavering line, and mistaking him for a row of geese going inland from the ocean, went into their houses cheerily rubbing their hands and saying that winter was coming, and that we would soon have snow. Soon even there the twilight faded away, and when they descended at the edge of the world it was night, and the moon was shining. Ocean, the ancient river, narrow and shallow there, flowed by and made no murmur. Whether the Giblins banqueted or whether they watched by the door, they also made no murmur. And Alderic dismounted and took his armor off, and saying one prayer to his lady, swam with his pickaxe. He did not part from his sword for fear that he might meet with a Giblin. Landed the other side, he began to work at once, and all went well with him. Nothing put out its head from any window, and all were lighted so that nothing within could see him in the dark. The blows of his pickaxe were dulled in the deep walls. All night he worked. No sound came to molest him, and at dawn the last rocks swerved and tumbled inwards, and the river poured in after. Then Aldrich took a stone and went to the bottom step and hurled the stone at the door. He heard the echoes roll into the tower. Then he ran back and dived through the hole in the wall. He was in the emerald cellar. There was no light in the lofty vault above him, but diving through twenty feet of water, he felt the floor all rough with emeralds and open coffers full of them. By a faint ray of the moon, he saw that the water was green with them, and easily filling a satchel, he rose again to the surface. And there were the giblins, waist-deep in water, with torches in their hands. And without saying a word, or even smiling, 
They neatly hanged him on the outer wall, and the tale is one of those that have not a happy ending. It was the custom on Tuesdays in the temple of Chubu for the priest to enter at evening and chant, There is none but Chubu. And all the people rejoiced and cried out, There is none but Chubu. And honey was offered to Chubu and maize and fat. Thus was he magnified. Chubu was an idol of some antiquity, as may be seen from the color of the wood. He had been carved out of mahogany, and after he was carved, he had been polished. Then they had set him up on the diorite pedestal with the brazier in front of it for burning spices and the flat gold plates for fat. Thus they worshipped Chubu. He must have been there for over a hundred years when one day the priest came in with another idol into the temple of Chubu and set it up on a pedestal near Chubu's and sang, There is also Shemish. Shemish was palpably a modern idol, and although the wood was stained with a dark red dye, you could see that he had only just been carved. And honey was offered to Shemish as well as Chubu, and also maize and fat. The fury of Chubu knew no time limit. He was furious all that night, and next day he was furious still. The situation called for immediate miracles. To devastate the city with a pestilence and kill all his priests was scarcely within his power. Therefore, he wisely concentrated such divine powers as he had in commanding a little earthquake. Thus, thought Chubu, will I reassert myself as the only god, and men shall spit upon Shemish. Chubu willed it and willed it, and still no earthquake came when suddenly he was aware that the hated Shemish was daring to attempt a miracle too. He ceased to busy himself about the earthquake and listened, or shall I say felt, for what Shemish was thinking, for gods are aware of what passed in the mind by a sense that is other than any of our five. Shemish was trying to make an earthquake too. The new god's motive was probably to assert himself. I doubt if Chubu understood or cared for his motive. It was sufficient for an idol already aflame with jealousy that his detestable rival was on the verge of a miracle. All the power of Chubu veered round at once and set dead against an earthquake, even a little one. It was thus in the temple of Chubu for some time, and then no earthquake came. To be a god and to fail to achieve a miracle is a despairing sensation. It is as though among men one should determine upon a hearty sneeze and as though no sneeze should come. It is as though one should try to swim in heavy boots or remember a name that is utterly forgotten. All these pains were Shemish's. And upon Tuesday the priests came in and the people, and they did worship Chubu and offered fat to him, saying, O oh, Chubu, who made everything. And then the priests sang, There is also Shemish. And again the people rejoiced and cried out, There is also Shemish. And Chubu was put to shame and spake not for three days. Now there were holy birds in the temple of Chubu, and when the third day was come and the night thereof, it was as if it were revealed to the mind of Chubu that there was dirt upon the head of Shemish. And Chubu spake unto Shemish, as speak the gods, moving no lips, nor yet disturbing the silence, saying, There is dirt upon thy head, O Shemish. All night long he muttered again and again, There is dirt upon Shemish's head. And when it was dawn and voices were heard far off, Chubu became exultant with earth's awakening things and cried out till the sun was high, Dirt, dirt, dirt upon the head of Shemish. And at noon he said, So Shemish would be a god. Thus was Shemish confounded. And with Tuesday one came and washed his head with rose water, and he was worshipped again, and they sang, There is also Shemish. 
and yet was Chubu content. For he said, the head of Shemesh has been defiled. And again, his head was defiled. It is enough. And one evening, lo, there was dirt on the head of Chubu also. And the thing was perceived by Shemesh. It is not with the gods as it is with men. We are angry one with another and turn from our anger again, but the wrath of the gods is enduring. Chubu remembered, and Shemish did not forget. They spake as we do not speak, in silence yet heard of each other, nor were their thoughts as our thoughts. We should not judge them by merely human standards. All night long they spake, and all night said they these words only, Dirty Chubu, Dirty Shemish, Dirty Chubu, Dirty Shemish, all night long. Their wrath had not tired at dawn, and neither had wearied of his accusation, and gradually Chubu came to realize that he was nothing more than the equal of Shemish. All gods are jealous, but this equality with the upstart Shemish a thing of painted wood a hundred years newer than Chubu, and this worship given to Shemish in Chubu's own temple were particularly bitter. Chubu was jealous even for a god, and when Tuesday came again, the third day of Shemish's worship, Chubu could bear it no longer. He felt that his anger must be revealed at all costs, and he returned with all the vehemence of his will to achieving a little earthquake. The worshippers had just gone from his temple when Chubu settled his will to attain this miracle. Now and then his meditations were disturbed by the now familiar dictum, Dirty Chubu, but Chubu willed ferociously, not even stopping to say what he longed to say and had already said nine hundred times, and presently even these interruptions ceased. They ceased because Shemish had returned to a project that he had never definitely abandoned, the desire to assert himself and exalt himself over Chubu by performing a miracle. And the district being volcanic, he had chosen a little earthquake, as the miracle most easily accomplished by a small god. Now an earthquake that is commanded by two gods has double the chance of fulfillment than when it is willed by one and an incalculably greater chance than when two gods are pulling different ways. As to take the case of older and greater gods, when the sun and the moon pull in the same direction and we have the biggest tides. Chubu knew nothing of the theory of tides and was too much occupied with his miracle to notice what Shemish was doing. And suddenly the miracle was an accomplished thing. It was a very local earthquake, for there are other gods than Chubu or even Shemish, and it was only a little one as the gods had willed, but it loosened some monoliths in a colonnade that supported one side of the temple, and the whole of one wall fell in, and the low huts of the people of that city were shaken a little, and some of their doors were jammed so that they would not open. It was enough, and for a moment it seemed that it was all, Neither Chubu nor Shemish commanded there should be more, but they had set in motion an old law, older than Chubu, the law of gravity, that that colonnade had held back for a hundred years, and the temple of Chubu quivered and then stood still, swayed once and was overthrown on the heads of Chubu and Shemish. No one rebuilt it, for nobody dared go near such terrible gods. Some said that Chubu wrought the miracle, but some said Shemish, and thereof schism was born. The weakly amiable, alarmed by the bitterness of rival sects, sought compromise and said that both had wrought it. But no one guessed the truth, that the thing was done in rivalry. And the saying arose, and both sects held this belief in common, that whoso toucheth Chubu shall die, or whoso looketh upon Shemish. That is how Chubu came into my possession when I traveled once beyond the hills of Ting. I found him in the fallen temple of Chubu, with his hands and toes sticking up out of the rubbish, lying on his back. And in that attitude, just as I found him, I keep him to this day on my mantelpiece.
as he is less liable to be upset that way. Sheemish was broken, so I left him where he was. And there is something so helpless about Chibu with his fat hands stuck up in the air that sometimes I am moved out of compassion to bow down to him and pray, saying, O oh, Chibu, thou that made everything, help thy servant. Chibu cannot do much, though once I am sure that at a game of bridge he sent me the ace of trumps after I had not held a card worth having for the whole of the evening. And chance would have done as much as that for me, but I do not tell this to Chibu. I do not think that there are many subjects that do not come up for discussion in their turn at the billiards club. Art, business, sport, politics, games, and science all have their turn. It was the turn of science one day last winter when I chanced to be in the club with Jorkins, Turbot, and a few others. Someone was speaking of the benefits that science had given the age, and we were mentioning the names of men who had especially benefited all of us. Benefits, blurted out Jorkins. <laughs> men who think of benefits may be useful to us. No doubt they are, but they are not scientists. Not, said someone. Not primarily, said Jorkins. The pure scientist doesn't care a damn for people like us. He only cares for science and people other than scientists who take an interest in it or talk about it or even benefit by it are no more to him than the crowd is to a cricketer. They are merely in the way. I think a scientist, said one of us, who had often addressed important meetings, has as much feeling for what I may call the man in the street as anyone has. No, said Jorkins, he can't stand him. I knew a scientist once. Indeed, he was about the greatest scientist of our time. Who was he, said Turbot. You wouldn't have heard of him, said Jorkins. He never did anything of the kind that one calls useful, never made any tiresome little inventions like the perforation of pepper pots or any of those things. He was just devoted to pure science. Not that he didn't make inventions. He made one very remarkable invention. But the public would never have supported him, and he never went on with it. The public would have supported him if he had been any good, said Turbot. I don't think so, said Jorkins. They would never have understood him. And indeed, I happened to have been the man who told him so, and then he gave up his invention. But he was one of the most remarkable scientists that the country has ever known. What was his invention, we asked. I'll tell you, said Jorkins. His invention was to make fine weather. He'd been working, of course, for years, and he had got a most remarkable control of the various forces upon which weather depends. I got to know him through no scientific attainments of mine, but as a man who knew some men who would be likely to back him on the commercial side. And he needed commercial backing, though he cared nothing about it. He only cared for science. Well, in this capacity, I was introduced to him and allowed to be present at his great experiment. I knew at least two firms that I think would have supported him if I had given them a favorable report. Never mind now who they were, but I saw the experiment, and it was the greatest scientific experiment I have ever seen. He was, as I think I told you, the most remarkable scientist of our day. Idolf was his name, though of course it means nothing to you, nor to anybody for that matter, but that is often the way with our very greatest men. Well, he had his method of ensuring fine weather, and I was to see an experiment. So I suggested, rather naturally, that the experiment should be about harvest time. Do you know, even that much utility enraged him. He said that science wasn't the slave of this, that, and the other. Fortunately, he had one or two scientific friends who had more sense. And it was decided that the experiment should take place about harvest time after all. And take place it did, about ten years ago. It all happened in a room at the top of a house whose number I have forgotten, but it lay between Hyde Park and the Cromwell Road. There he had his electric batteries that did the work. He only had to turn a switch and move it about according to the number of volts he wanted. They wanted a band of copper round the earth. That was what they needed me for, so that if I reported favorably on their experiment to the people in the city, 
and if they took the thing up, they could afford to pay for the copper. As they hadn't got the copper band, they had to use makeshifts, and they told me the experiment would not be nearly as impressive as it would be otherwise. It was impressive enough. What kind of makeshift, asked Herbert. They had to send a charge of electricity around the world, said Jorkin, several times around, as a matter of fact, at certain intervals. But how on earth could they do that, asked Herbert, if they hadn't the copper? Not as difficult as you might suppose, said Jorkins. There is plenty of metal running round the world, railway lines, cables, telegraph wires, and so forth, and they got the use of some of them by paying a small rent. And they connected up with a few miles of wire of their own to the house near the Cromwell Road. There were five of them altogether, five scientists, I mean, and me, and we all met in Idolf's room about ten years ago, and the harvest was just coming on in the south of England. And do you know, I had to tell Idolf when that would be. <laughs> he hadn't the slightest idea what time of year they cut corn, and he evidently didn't care. But we got him with some difficulty to bring up his fine weather at a time that people would want it. And he only did that because he didn't care. One time of year was as unimportant to him as any other. And it was only science that mattered. People are praying for it in the churches, I said. Oh, very well, he said listlessly. A maid showed me up to Idolf's room, and all the rest were already there. It was three o'clock in the afternoon, the time that I had been asked for. We'd better begin, said Idolf, after the briefest greeting. And then they clustered round his big machine, of which I knew nothing except that it was electrical, and I sat by the window. The machine was against the wall opposite the window, and Idolf sat down at it with his back to me, and the other four watched him. A fly walked on the window pane, and I couldn't help thinking that I, the unscientific member of the party, was pretty much to those five what the fly was to me. Mind you, a fly may have quite a fine intelligence, for all we know. You were saying that he sat down at his machine, Jorkins, I said. Yes, said Jorkins, he sat down at it, and he got to work at once. There were two small clouds in the sky. The window faced south. Do you see those two small clouds over Kensington, he said. He spoke loud so as to be heard above the noise his machine was making, and every word he said I heard very clearly until much later in the experiment. But there was a curious tone in his voice that must have come from his back being turned to me and from his caring nothing for my opinion and thinking that nothing mattered except his machine. I said I saw the clouds. I'm going to brush them out of the way, he said. Then he pushed a switch a short way from left to right, and I turned to look at the clouds. You didn't think he could move them, said Turbot. I couldn't help it, said Jorkins, with all those scientists standing around. They took him so absolutely for granted that I couldn't disbelieve him. And there was something in the way he talked to me, too, that made me feel any doubts I might entertain would have no more chance of holding their own than the clouds. And the clouds didn't either. They started to move at once. They moved at once over Kensington, but not in a way that I liked. They turned a nasty color, and the edges got ragged, and they moved more like birds than like clouds, only that they looked more helpless than birds, more like small, dark sheep that had got into the sky and were being chased by a wolf. They're going, I said. Idolf only nodded his head in a quick way, as though he didn't want to be disturbed by obvious remarks from unscientific persons and the other four looked at him and at his machine, and no one paid any attention to me at all. The clouds became more ragged, and a queer light shone over everything, as though it came from the sky, but it could hardly have come from there, as the sky was turning black. Then I heard thunder. Idolf was still moving the switch slowly over. The clouds were moving now at a frightful pace, and the thunder was getting louder. The moment that the leading cloud rushed under a high roof that hid it, I called out to Idolf, the clouds have gone. But none of the five of them paid any attention, and Idolf went on moving his switch over. He jerked it rather quicker, if anything, and as he jerked it, there broke out on the left the way that the wind was coming from, a terrific burst of thunder. It was thunder that would have been unpleasant anywhere, but in the streets of a town, and coming so suddenly it sounded like artillery, quite close and shooting at you. What are you doing? I shouted. Hush, said one of the four men, gathered around Idolf. 
I'm bringing up some fine weather, Adolf answered. But it's thundering, I said. Not a remark one usually makes, but those five scientists looked so entranced with what Adolf was doing that really I doubted if they had heard the thunder at all. Are they gone yet, said one of them, and I knew they were talking about the two small clouds. Quite gone, I shouted, but nobody took any notice of me. Better give them a bit more, said the same man, and Idolf pushed the switch still more over. And then the lightning came, and of course the thunder after it. I suppose they heard it this time, for you couldn't hear anything else, but they went on talking among themselves, or rather shouting close in one another's ear. It was getting a bit too much. I left the window, for the sky was quite black now. It was hard to see anything, and the ribbons of lightning tearing down the sky were very nearly blinding. I went over to Adolf. The others wanted to stop me, but I shouldered them out of the way and went up to Adolf, who was bending over the switch with his back still to the storm, and I saw then that it was marked like a barometer with such words as change and fair, and he was pushing his brass bar towards fair. The skies turn black, I shouted. Yes, yes, the four friends of Idolf seemed to be saying and tried to get me out of the way. They were absolutely absorbed in what Idolf was doing and wanted no interruption from anyone to whom science meant nothing. And if they were absorbed, Idolf was rapt, bewitched, and inspired. He did not seem to hear my shout or even to see me. So I put the black sleeve of my coat in front of his eyes, between his eyes and his damn switchboard, and pointed to it with my other hand and shouted, Black! And then pointed to the sky. But Idolf only moved his switch past the word fair. And at that time the rain fell. It did not begin to fall like other showers. It just fell in one heap. It came down with such a crash that I did not believe it was possible that it could last. I thought all the rain in the sky had got upset all in one heap by that fool Idolf. But it did last, a dark gray cascade lit by lightning and drowning the noise of the thunder, though that was shaking the windows. And it was obviously getting worse. It seemed to me time to stop it. And at last, one of the four had his doubts, for he seemed to be saying something about the public perhaps being unworthy of Adolf's work, if I heard what he shouted. And at the word public, I stepped in. In matters of science, I was nobody to them, but... I did, in a way, represent the public. That is to say, I knew nothing of science, and I was concerned indirectly with the financial side of the thing, and I stepped in quickly, for I didn't know how long the roof would hold against all that weight of water, and the lightning was dancing all around us like devils in a small ballroom, and there was a gale getting up, too. They'll be ungrateful, I shouted at it off, the public. And I put as much authority into my voice as I could, as though I really represented the public. And Idolf looked up at that, and I took the opportunity of shouting into his face, not into his ear, but right into his face, the two words, stop it. Something seemed to convince him that I had the public behind me, for he gave a kind of despairing sigh and moved the switch back. It was too dark to see what he moved it to, for the rain from the roof was coming in a curved wave over the window, as though we were living under a weir. But I could see that he moved his switch from right to left, and I suppose he put it to change. I noticed, dark as it was, that the others seemed disappointed, but they did nothing to stop him. There was one more awful clap of thunder that shook everything movable in the room, and the deluge turned to ordinary rain. The change in the rain must have taken place immediately, though one couldn't see it at once, because the waterfall from the roof came down for a few seconds longer. Then it was ordinary heavy rain. And those lightnings stop, and I hope that I never see anything like it again. Then there were a few more claps of explosive thunder, and then for some minutes we heard the thunder claps far away that had actually taken place before the end of the storm. Ordinary quiet rain was falling now, and it went on all that night and all the next day. You may remember that year when all the oats in England were laid flat. <laughs> the other four men were all grouped round Idolf, so awed by his genius that no one was taking any notice of me. And it was genius. Like genius in painting and poetry, it was, of course, eccentric. But genius, undoubtedly. I saw in their faces what they all thought of me, when they thought of me at all. They could see that I was thinking about the harvest, but no such bucolic interest ever touched them. 
All the harvests in the world were mere vulgarity to them compared with science. You could see that what they were thinking about was that science had taken a hand in men's affairs and a firm hand, and they were delighted. Idolf was leaning back in his chair, and they were all gathered round him. I represented to them, as I could see clearly enough from their faces, the doubting, ignorant public that scorns genius, the men that let poets starve, the men that burn the earlier scientists at the stake as magicians, and to go back further still, the men who stoned the saints. <laughs> so I slunk out of the room.